You're listening to the Beyond the Dojo podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Jeremiah. And we are ending... I'm going to shut your phone off. Sorry, dude. We are ending... Well, Florida is is reaching into the ends of quarantine. Mm. We're just... We're so close we can taste it. Mm. Does it taste like Oreos, dear? Yes, it does. Really good. Creamy. <laughs> He's eating, chocolate cookie. Mm-hmm. He's, he's eating Oreos. And uh, so actually, uh, speaking of which, so we get to open tomorrow, and we are excited. We've gotten all kinds of projects. He's drinking milk, so I'm going to speak for him. <laughs> Not that I don't usually do that anyway. Right. <laughs> is that woman splaining? Uh, probably. I think that's what that is. I think we talked about that before, too. Yep. Um, anyhow, we get to open tomorrow. We've been doing all kinds of fun projects over quarantine. Some of them at the dojo, some of them business-wise, some of them personal development, some of them around our house. So we're excited to show off some of the crap we've come up with over these eight weeks. Yeah. I've never been on restriction this long as an adult. You know, it almost feels like really, really early summer, except that we don't run classes. Like, normally during the summer, we have less of a schedule, less of a uh, heavy schedule. Yeah, I doubt that's going to happen this year. Well, I just mean, like, that's what this past eight eight weeks has felt like, is, like, summertime. yeah. But now we're about to get into summer, so it's going to be like four months of summer instead of two. Yeah, that's going to be a bit much. Yeah, this year is like so much for the roaring 20s. All right. <laughs> or like the first year of the 2020. Anyhow, but we, we've done a lot of cool stuff over this quarantine, so we're pretty excited to open back yeah, up. pretty inconsistent with the podcast, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, which is... I guess we don't really have a lot to talk about, because like mean, all we've done is watch other people post, put stuff on Facebook, but... We tried to not watch that um, yeah, in some exactly. cases, so like, not sorry it. to be judgmental, but it's our podcast, so if you don't like it, go away. Yeah, well, yeah, basically. Yeah. So, random thought. Um, I uh, take voice lessons. Obviously, Jeremiah knows that, so I'm not saying that to him. I take voice lessons, and I listen to a lot of vocal coaches on um, YouTube, and I was listening to one about an hour ago. And he was critiquing someone's vocal technique, and he said, okay, it sounds great at the time, but is that something that they can sustain for an entire career? And I think that really good teachers are ones who look at technical aspects of an art or a performance or whatever, and that's the question that they ask is like, okay, that looks great, but can you sustain that long term? I think we've talked, we've talked about that quite a bit as far as like karate training, but just a random thought in case you haven't heard those episodes – a good teacher, one of the one of the many qualities of a good teacher is someone who can look at a movement, a sound, a performance, and can be like, okay, yeah. can you do that long term? Yeah. Will yeah, you great. wear and tear on your body too much in order to do it long term or not? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, all right, yeah. Basically. Yeah. yeah. That's a all big right. problem in the karate community because... Yeah, well, I think the big problem in the karate community is that it's such nowadays it's such a broad thing the art of karate is such a broad thing i mean you go yeah. from mcdojo kind of tournament style point style sparring to you know your wkf stuff to your jk stuff to like your old school hardcore you know full combat kyokushinkai stuff i mean it's it's all over the place so you mean like different uh, <clears throat> goals and stuff no different focuses mm-hmm. uh, i think i'd add to the good teachers that a, a good teacher a great teacher can see where your focus is and then it's still and still still teach you something that has depth and and, and knowledge oh my gosh There's stop wealth, it you know the wealth of knowledge there you know mm-hmm. so i would say that some of it has to do with you know a broad spectrum also yeah it being able, nowadays mm-hmm. nowadays it has to have a little bit larger spectrum to see what and, and how they can handle that I'm not saying being a jack of all trades. Yeah. I'm saying being an ace, but being willing to, to look being at Being willing to accept other people's goals, you mean? Is that what you well, mean? Like, or intentions accept, for training? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I guess it's more of like a coaching style. It's the ability to, to coach or, or teach someone to meet their intended potential. What they wanted out of the art or what they felt like was important. It could change. Well, it could be influenced by the teacher. Mm-hmm. Well, I will say an alternative point of view to that is that in some cases, it would be it would be better for some people to train with someone who coaches more to that vein. Because, like, in, in other arts or whatever, you have people that, like, one coach will work with one type of clientele or one type of student, and another one will, will coach another yeah, type. Yeah, I was talking about karate. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I mean, uh, in karate, sometimes that might be better. Sometimes. Obviously, we can't really pick and choose in our this, students in, in most in this, cases. In uh, this day and age, the absolute teacher is more of a hindrance than it is a benefit in the sense of there's a lot of guys going, this is the only way. This is the only way. And they don't really are qualified to say that, nor are they honest about it. Yeah. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. So, like, we've said multiple times, like, the way that we teach or our focus as a dojo or our dojo culture is developing in a certain sense. And if mm-hmm. somebody wants something other than that, we don't really provide that. You know, right. we're not a daycare. We're not going to pick your kids up from school. So right. if you want that atmosphere, you have to go somewhere else. If that's your goal or your child's goal for some reason. Right. I'm so not that's... saying that we have to be all encompassing either. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. just saying a great teacher, yeah. even though it is, it might have the perspective of self-defense and pure application, mm-hmm. it still has the ability to coach up a world-class kata guy. Yeah, okay, I can or, see or that. understand the strategies of, of, of point sparring. I mean, yeah. it's all relative after a certain point, but that certain point is rarely met. Yeah. So I was just adding to that saying, hey, even a great a great teacher would have these aspects also. Yeah. Well, and, I think that those are just multiple sides of the same coin, though. I mean, you have a good technical teacher. They can teach a really good kata champion. Not, or... a, lot of, not a lot of people could do that. Okay. The, not, the, the, the talent's not there. Yeah. I mean, you can look at some of these JK and JKS instructors like um, Kagawa. Mm-hmm. Kagawa a, a, a decent, had a decent kata and, and a good kumite champion, and his fighters are good. Mm-hmm. You know, but I don't really see a lot of kumite, a kata champions coming from him either. But I might be wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, it's just, to me, there's not a lot of... Yeah. They could do it, so... Yeah. Anyhow... Today's the the intention of today's oh. podcast. Oh, did you oh, have a random the thought? The other thing, the other thing about a, a good sign of a teacher is the ability to teach on multiple media platforms. I guess <laughs> the, and, the ability to pivot. <laughs> yeah, and I'd have to say that I am horrible at that, and I just, I just. Uh, you didn't do that bad. I, would I didn't say do that weeks. bad, but it definitely is something that I felt like I was cheating my students in a sense because I wasn't able to give them the same level of coaching and, and critique as I would in a normal class, and be able to kind of help them progress in a sense. I felt like I was more of a like a professional counter. <laughs> yeah, well, and, I, I kind of felt the same way, but I don't think it was that you were cheating your students. It's just that I told you it's just a situation. Felt. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I felt the same literal. way. Yeah. I'm sitting there watching the screen, and I'm just like, I could correct these things, but it's like... Why it's, it's why so, even bother it's right so now. hard to correct it because you yeah. gotta get the kids on the same page. Anyways, very frustrating. But yeah, I would say that'd be another sign of a good teacher is the ability to to teach on multiple platforms. Yeah, definitely. Well, we maybe have we'll have to work on our technology skills or structure. God forbid, in case this ever happens again. Or just be, provide deeper wealth in some more simpler techniques. Yeah, that too. All right, so today is a little Q&A because we were running out of podcast topics. I guess we could have just taken off with the topic that we just started, but anyhow, maybe we'll do that another day. So um, we were on our Instagram stories and asked, actually in my Facebook story, and asked if anybody had any suggestions for topics. So we actually ended up with some questions. The first one is from, sorry, I don't actually know your name, but his uh, tag, or his uh, handle is nm underscore martial arts, nm underscore martial arts. He said, speaking of this topic, do you think with how the world is going, karate will go back to its roots of pure, like pure martial arts and training and less competition? Uh, sorry. Um, do you think that how, with how the world is going, karate will go back to its roots of pure martial arts and will be less competition or my child needs focus and discipline? So do we think, does he think, do we think that it'll get away from competition and focus and discipline for children and go back to roots of pure in quotes? Uh, I'll say this. I think there's definitely going to be a shift. Okay. A shift of focus and amongst each individual dojo, Mm -hmm. because I think this time is going to end of reflection and, and the whole quarantine thing has made people focus on who they are Yeah. and what, what their brand is and stuff like that. So I think people are not going to be so, I think. 
although the the martial arts schools that have you know the multiple styles your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu your your Kung Fu your Tai Chi whatever and all in one like an umbrella kind of uh, building mm -hmm. I think they're still going to survive but the the guys like us that are traditional schools when you're talking about the shift of focus from sport to Budo to to self empowerment I guess in a sense. Um, Honestly, I see it happen with us, in a sense. Of you like, think that we will go yeah, back we, to? Yeah, I've seen we, we've already made that shift, almost, in a sense. In the past two months? Yeah, over mm -hmm. the past two months, we've made a, a, a significant decisions on how we approach our classes and what was, what is needed and what isn't. Yeah. And that, to me, is is the shift that we're I think people are expecting. Yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully, uh, karate does shift back to more realistic you know, application or ideas of traditional training. That, to me, would be wonderful because that's what I like to promote. Mm -hmm. But there's no saying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the self-discipline thing, the children, my child needs self-discipline. Mm -hmm. That is a, to me, one thing I'd, I'd hate for any dojo to shift away from. Because to me, that is the universal gift that karate gives to everybody, even not the ones just, that not just children, not just children. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not. It's I don't believe that the the superstar athletes or the world champions are the gift in karate. It's the ability to instill discipline in somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, that really don't give a crap what they're doing there. They don't even care to be there. Yeah. But even though they don't care to be there and they hate to, you know, they give you such a hard time. Do, do during the due process they instill discipline mm -hmm. you know it's part of the process and to me that would be a shame to lose yeah now do we completely focus just on that no we don't take a western approach we take a very eastern approach mm -hmm. in instilling discipline yeah and that's a, a whole different thing if you're talking about western approach eastern approach that's a different approach a uh, different topic altogether yeah I think um, I think the shift is going to be a little bit different than, than the way the question is phrased so like uh less of a focus on discipline like in children I don't think that's going to happen I think that what I have what I have witnessed from other people like talking on Facebook and what we have obviously discussed is I think that dojo heads are going to have less um tolerance for people who don't care like so we've lost some students in this process and I know a lot of other people have lost enormous numbers of students in this process which is honestly is a, is a huge shame and I feel really sorry for them and and the the burden that it will be on their business but I think a lot of people have actually viewed that as a good thing like we kind of viewed it as a good thing and that's gonna sound kind of harsh but we've talked about it multiple times that we would rather work with people who actually want to be there and want to work with us and granted a lot of kids are kind of pushed into things because their parents want them to try new things or they want them to be disciplined or even you know some adults will do stuff that they don't want to do it's it's rarer um but it does happen and i feel like this process has weeded people out essentially what happened is if you weren't really interested in karate whenever quarantine began and all these martial arts schools went online if you weren't really interested in it then you didn't continue so if you haven't continued in two months the likelihood that you're going to return is really right. low so i i actually think the quality of karate is going to go up because the people who actually want to train who want to invest the time are going to be the ones to continue i think that as you know people's dojos are going to thin out for a while i would encourage other dojo heads because this is what we're going to be doing i would encourage you to take advantage of that and do like drill into I mean, granted you haven't gotten a chance to like teach your students in person for a while so you're probably excited to do that but take this time to really invest in your dojo base and build up the quality of the people there um so that maybe in the long run it does have a good effect on karate is it gonna pull us away from competition i don't think so people like competition is it gonna pull us away from hey i'm bringing in my kid because they need discipline no but i think that you have we now have an opportunity to create um you know better quality karate code overall maybe so mm. i think that in the end it's going to be a good thing but do i think it's going to shift away no not really yeah, I would. I guess I would translate translate to that. It, it solidifies the community more than anything yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not that we want to get rid of any students. We're not that privileged. No, we're not saying that. <laughs> so that being said, yeah, but yeah, no, we're not not saying we want to get rid of students by any yeah. means. But but um, you know, I think what's going to really 
be affected, and I don't, it's it's to come, it's to see. Or I guess I would like to see it not happen. As the with this, all these online seminars and all these free seminars of people giving away this information, how's that going to affect the teachers that are traveling in, and teaching? The majority of their income is from seminars. You know, I wonder if it, it helps them in the long run and promotes their, their name to get further out, or is it one of those things that people go, you know what, I, you're giving it away free on online. I could just take one of those other classes, and I don't know, man. I, I think that some people will take advantage of that if they're going to continue doing that, but I I highly doubt that these teachers, if they have any brains at all, are going to continue to let those Zoom courses go for free. I think they will. They're probably doing that right now as a great way to self promote. Right. Um, but once people are back at work and they have money to spend, I think that they'll probably charge for them. At least that's what I would do if I were them. Right. Or but I would really limit how many free classes I was you offering. Know, you- you, you still have countries, you know, although we're getting back to it, you got to remember there's countries that have already said openly, you know, end of July, August. Yeah, well, I mean, in the long, I mean, I mean in the long term, in that, the long dude, term. That's, that's a long time. I don't see any in live seminars happening at least until like when maybe like late fall or early winter. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean like right now. I just mean in the long, in the long run. I think that this will end up being good for karate overall, but, um, I don't know. I don't think people are going to get screwed up by the online stuff. I think that people don't really like it as much. I mean, it's cool that you're able to stay at home, but it's definitely not, not as the same it's not the yeah. same as going to a seminar. And anybody that's been to a seminar knows that that's just the only advantage is you save a bunch of money because you don't have to travel. So, mm-hmm. uh, any other thoughts on that? No. Okay. So next question was from Sam Young. What up, Sam? Sam. Um, thought on su- thoughts on supplemental training in Aikido, Judo, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, or what you like or don't like in other karate styles. All right. Um, I want to make sure there's a difference between cross training and supplemental training. Mm. Cross training to me is that you actually indulge yourself in the art and you're trying to achieve a, a rank in yeah, the art. Like MMA type thing? Uh, no, more like uh, if I go to Aikido and I start cross training Aikido, the goal for me going to Aikido is to get maybe down level in Aikido. Okay. Not just to train for six months, go, oh, I understand it, and then move on to the next. Yeah. That's supplemental training to me. Okay. Because when you dibble-dabble in something, that's supplemental. Yeah. Or even if you don't even go to a formal class and you're doing it through online courses or books or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. To me, that is beneficial. Mm-hmm. To supplemental training, is, it is beneficial because if you're trying, personally, if you're trying to improve your Shotokan Karate, then you, got, you want to kind of keep the Shotokan perspective Mm -hmm. now obviously when other arts do different things they have it's not a legitimacy thing it's it's like how else can this move be used Mm -hmm. for example if you go on youtube you can go to a certain uh, mma video places where they go oh the you should see kata moves in the fights and they show where they're hooking someone's leg and they're throwing them across the shoulder as a techie showdown move or Mm -hmm. they're they're doing another move, like the Yamazuki move, when out of by side eye. That is a very common thing you'll see in the you, you know the uh, MMA fighters. Where it's like a, it looks very similar. To it like looks very movie. similar, but you can see that what we do in our art mm. can be applied a different way. So is that more like an application type thing? Do you think that supplemental training is just I, so you can see more application? Personally, that's what I see. I'm into now, but I began looking at it for better mechanics, better mm-hmm. alignment. Um, Ken Kokujuku does their kokuts that are slightly different than the JK Shotokan lineage. Mm-hmm. Uh, they turn their back foot in, maybe like not even just maybe 15, 20 degrees, but turning that back foot in changes the, the pressure and the alignment on your rear leg mm-hmm. and is a very effective way to have a very fluid and movement free back stance. Yeah. You're I able to drive off the back leg I better. You're that. able to go as, as, and shift your weight so much easier. Yeah. So to me, if you look at my back stance, I, I tend to have my back foot turn in just a little bit mm-hmm. where I can feel that feeling. Yeah. I don't think that's anything wrong with that. Um, and I still picked it up off of supplemental training off of a, a different art. Yeah. Or, or a different style, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, to me, that is very beneficial. Yeah. Because what you see and make the dots connect is not a universal truth. It is just true to you in a sense. You mean like with the supplemental stuff? With the supplemental stuff. What, yeah. You know, you're you're just kind of doing your own thing. This is helping your personal training. Yeah. Um, now, I'll be honest. Supplemental training is not always beneficial. 
it's good for the mind. It's good for your critical thinking. But sometimes you can get on the back, you know, get a bad idea and get married to it. Yeah. At what point do you think someone should, if they're going to do supplemental training, at what level of experience should they be doing supplemental training? Uh, nowadays, Shodan above, I guess. Mm. And, and I'd say cautious with Shodan Nidan. Yeah, so maybe uh, like Sandan level for sure. Uh, for sure, I think that'd be the best. Like you get your most benefit from it. Yeah. Because it, it, you know, that's when you you should have a very strong foundation in the art, mm-hmm. and then from there you should be able to see things easier. Shodan Nidan. I mean, I don't ever want to limit someone's curiosity. Yeah. And I would just encourage at Shodan Nidan level people talk to someone you trust. Mm-hmm. In, in the sense of you trust their opinion on karate and how they're trying to do things. Mm-hmm. Have conversations with that person. Yeah. And see what you're looking at is what you think you're looking at. Yeah. Um, but that that's just a personal thing. I think Shodan Nidan should always have like a mentor. Um, but that's me, just me. So So I had th- some thoughts on this the other day, uh, like the day after I got we got this question. Um, I, I may have thought about this before, but I was thinking it might be useful for me to watch like other martial arts styles, just like watch them on YouTube and just like watch the way that they're moving mm-hmm. to help. Cause like I kind of asked you about this earlier about a couple minutes ago about getting other ideas for application. Mm-hmm. So not to like do judo, but there are so many movements. There's, your body only moves so many ways effectively. So if we have a movement, that looks like a judo movement or a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu movement or whatever, and I can see that from another art and seeing them applying it, sometimes that might give me ideas for what we're doing. Not, maybe not in every case, but I felt like supplemental like viewing would maybe help rather than necessarily doing. I mean, I guess doing would be helpful too, yeah. but I've never, I haven't really experienced that, so I can't really speak too much on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that watching other people do other things, like we've seen the video, like you were just talking about the videos with watching MMA guys, they'll actually show like a dude doing Han Yuan Don and a, and a dude in an MMA fight side by like yeah, side by side or whatever, or flip back a, and forth, yeah. and they show you like how it's how it's that move applied in a in a fighting situation. So I think that that's that's useful. Yeah, um, I, I will say cognitive or um. Supplemental training is, to me, more cognitive than anything else. Rather There's, than actually learning a skill. Yeah, well, it's to me, it's re- reinforcing the motor skills you already have. Yeah. That, if that makes any sense at all. To what? me, that's the control, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that's different than seeking out someone who who has something in their karate that's a little bit different than yours. Okay, for, for example... Uh, Seven, eight years ago, I started training with Rick Hodden mm-hmm. because Rick was relaxed, mm-hmm. fluid, and very loose. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big dude. Mm-hmm. I get tight in my karate. My, my, my karate is tight. Mm-hmm. So I searched out someone who deliberately searched out someone who had something I didn't have. Mm-hmm. And I, you can say, oh, that's just looking for another teacher. But to me, it was very deliberate. Like, yeah. oh, he's got this looseness. I need to have it because I'm too tight. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I trained with them and, and tried to understand where his perspective was and understand his movement ideas. And then from there, that's where it kind of blurs because to me, I still train with Rick and I still uh, appreciate his classes. Um, it's just a matter of that supplemental training mm-hmm. isn't as intense as it was before. Mm-hmm. So it's less of something that you're focused on. You yeah, mean? it's less of a focus of like, I got to get that, I got to get that. It's more like I'm enjoying the training more. Yeah. Okay. And just kind of reinforcing what he's always taught and, and trying to re- remind, like, touch and base. Yeah. You know? Um, and to me, that is a, a manifestation of physical supplemental training. But the yeah. majority of it, supplemental training is... Is mental. You know, mental. It's cognitive. Yeah, I actually wanted to. Back, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I want to backtrack a little bit. I think the important point to note, if you are, I think the difference is, if you are committed to Shotokan Karate, for example, if you're going to train in another art, do not let the mechanics that you're being taught in that art change what you're doing in Shotokan, unless for some reason you run this by a, sh- a Shotokan person who is your mentor or teacher, like I think you were saying. And it, it, sh- it proves to be good for you. If, if it's going to take away from your Shotokan, which in some cases it could because there's just different emphases, emphases on different arts, then it's not worth 
you investing too much time in. It's it's good as a supplement, but yeah. I think it depends on what your goal is. Are you trying to get like Jeremiah said? Are you looking at trying to rank in that in that art, or are you looking at learning some things to make your Shotokan or or whatever art you're doing right. um, initially better? And that's a borderline cross training thing issue too. Is like when you cross train things, what art are you saying is the dominant? Yeah. Art? Which one are you trying to hear to the most? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And a lot of times when you talk to these guys across train, they, they're they no, neither here or there. Mm -hmm. They're not adhering to one thing or another. And yeah. it's like, so you why have to, even cross train? So you have to beware when you start doing that because then all of your arts are going to look like crap. Yeah, they'll all form into this thing that you think is. Yeah. Which isn't wrong because you are an artist, but at the same time, if you're trying to be good at that pure right. thing, if you're trying to be claim to be a good thing at a certain art, you need to make sure you have those characteristics. And this is kind of my my issue with MMA is that because there's so much like back and forth and not enough of an emphasis on one thing. Granted, their their intention is totally different. They're looking purely at fighting in the ring. So mm -hmm. in that case, okay, like I don't know, just throw on some boxing gloves and beat each other up, but. I feel like if you're going to call it a an art, a martial art, there should be some kind of, like, in, I don't know. Structure. Maybe. There should be a little bit more structure and a little yeah. bit more focus on technique. I think they'd be better fighters if they did, but, yeah, but that's Yeah, they, they are focusing on technique. It just doesn't look like technique to us. Yeah. That's, okay. the, that's the thing. Um, but, yeah, uh, I would discourage anybody to cross-train, honestly. Ever? Ever. I, I would discourage it completely. Um, supplemental training? Yes. Oh, oh, you mean okay, sorry. But cross train yeah. into another art. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, it that's... takes you. It takes a special person to be able to separate those things and be able to do it the right way for both arts. Yeah. Uh, and then be able to interpret it on your own. I will say though that sometimes, if you've trained long enough in one art, if you go into a completely different martial art, sometimes you will have. If you have good enough mechanics in your base art, you'll go into another art and you'll already be way ahead in that art technically. Like they're. They're, they may be looking for similar mechanics. So I've heard that judo um, is kind of like that with Shotokan. Like there's been Shotokan guys that have gone to judo and they're like, oh yeah, you're already like, you know, at least black belt level in judo because yeah. you have certain movements that you're able to do yeah, very that, easily. That was a story referenced between Kano Sensei, who was the founder of judo, and Konokoshi Sensei, who was the founder of Shotokan. Um, that was also back in the day when karate was taught to be purely self-defense. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of the movements nowadays wouldn't could be really compared. Okay. Um, it is a grappling art, though, and we have a lot of grappling in our in our katas. We sure do. Uh, I mean, we might be blind to them and think that our <laughs> application is punch and kick. That's not how it is. But this is why. This is why it's good to at least watch other martial arts so that you can right. learn those things or use that arts training as a supplement so that you can right. re like so that you can see a purer version of the grappling that is in Shotokan. Right. So my personal opinions and you know I'm a very I guess opinionated person. That's why uh, we have shoren, a podcast shoren ryu, which is an Okinawan karate style mm -hmm. is would be a style I'd watch just to see a realistic application. Mm -hmm. Because if you watch their karate against the air, it's very you could tell almost see the, the intention of everything they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoy their application stuff, although I, I think some of their main ideas I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, so Shonenu is one that I would look for that has application in mind, pure application in mind. Yeah. yeah. Shotokan Karate, man. Um, there's nothing wrong with watching the, all the little side branches of Shotokan. Shotokai. Yeah. Uh, Shotokan Karate of America. That's... SKA is slightly different than the JKA stuff. Everybody believes that Shotokan Karate is purely JKA because it's the largest organization. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's only a branch of multiple different branches. Waldo Ru is from Shotokan. Mm -hmm. um, Shotokai, like I said before, those things are are Shotokan based, you know? So Yeah. Waldo Ru actually is Shotokan Karate and Jiu Jitsu put together. Oh, so really? that's, I believe, Konishi, I think is the guy's uh, founder name was 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 his intention is that he came from a very strong jiu-jitsu background and he blended the two arts together so um are there things that you don't like in other karate styles so that you kind of went into the what you like in about other because that was the other half of the question you kind of talked about a little bit what you like uh, in other karate styles are there things that you don't like in other karate styles before i talk <laughs> go ahead i don't know i don't get a good thought of that so i 
I haven't had as much experience across different styles. I've seen people in other styles. Um, I think the only thing I can say that I don't like in other karate styles, and I can't necessarily pinpoint which style, um, there's a few that, to, to me, when I watch some of their competitors or I watch them train, there's, like, a lot of wiggling stuff. Um, like, a lot of, <laughs> quote, vibration yeah, the that happens. Guys. Yeah, that drives yeah. me crazy. Now, I can say that about other styles, but Shotokan people do it too, and they also call it vibration in quotes, and that's not what was intended. I'm not going to say what it actually was intended because that's not my information to share, but basically the vibration concept is not like wiggle like you're a bowl of jello. Please explain to me how something vibrating is going to transfer force in a linear motion. It's not. Sorry. You have to show me the science behind right, that because I don't believe it. You know, that's, well, it, that's dr just, it drives me crazy. Dude, that's one of those lost in translation things. You okay. Know that. Well, anyhow, that's the only thing I can see that I don't like about other martial arts, but Shotokan people do it too, so I don't like. I just don't like it in general. Yeah. Um, I don't have a particular art that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. I have particular teachers or opinions from an art that I disagree with. Um, and I'll say this. If a teacher says it's only this way, you immediately lost me. Yeah, there's that not ever when, when a teacher. they speak of absolutes, I just I, st I step away because everybody's slightly different. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different understanding. There's a reason why there's multiple arts. Yeah, I mean there's a validity in every art. Mm -hmm. So for you to deny that, yeah, it, it kind of says that you're you're a schmuck. Yeah, I think there's, that there's truth in universal principles, but those principles have to be applied, even yeah. in fundamentals. So, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about individuals who represents the their their karate style or whatever. Yeah, and say I, that this I, is this is the way. Yeah, I just I they have no problems with different styles. I could see advantages in all of them. You know, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of when you talk to those guys that you know they're very absolute in their mind. It's like, dude, then you are limited in your knowledge. Yeah. You know, and then most of the times they just reiterate what they were taught. They don't understand why or how. That's horrible. Yeah. So. The last one. Huh? You want to go to the last question? What's the last question? So the last one wasn't really a question. It's from C. Anthony, one 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 eight on Instagram, um, and um, he just asked for bunkai. But I explained to him, you know, this is an audio podcast. He's like, well, then I'm gonna be listening really close. So I thought maybe we'll talk about like how do you get started in bunkai? How do you get started in or uh, well, we talked about bunkai before. How bunkai is like. The conceptualization, kind yeah. of, and and we think more like application, and because that, that's a really weird word. So let's just maybe use the word application. How do you get started in application? It let it say if you've never done, really done it before. Um, if you're in a traditional art and you your art is based on a kata system, okay, I would encourage you to practice the kata. Okay, memorize the moves. Okay. Just like uh, Funakoshi's book, you memorize the moves, mm -hmm. you start to understand the moves, then you start to apply the moves. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see, even in Heian Shodan, make yourself an unbelievable request. Tell yourself every move has 10, ten applications. <laughs> okay. And then be honest with yourself and genuinely, sincerely try to figure out 10. Yeah. Whatever number you get, you'll realize that that's where you're, you're at in your path. That's it. That's mm -hmm. what you understand. Yeah. Um, and then move on. And, uh, hey, on Shodan, it takes you a little while. You'll start to get understand. Once you start to see how everything plays mm -hmm. into application, mm -hmm. you'll be able to pick up more and more applications. Yeah. Um, please look beyond the punch kick stuff. Yeah. And look into like people grabbing a hold in you, uh, the, you know, lapel grab, the arm grab, cross, cross, cross handed grab, mm -hmm. uh, hook punches. Don't look at the standardized karate attacks. Look at more realistic street attacks because they will give you better ideas. Yeah. If you tend to do application with someone karate attacking you, mm -hmm. you'll fall into the routines that you practice in training. Yeah. You're not going to be looking for different things. For some reason, when a hook punch comes at you, it's a little different. Yeah. That and it's just a punch with a different trajectory, right? That's yeah. all. But it helps you kind of break beyond those bo that box, that form, you know? Yeah. So that's my encouragement. 10 applications per move. Don't be disappointed if you only get to the third or fourth move. You'll see from that practice that your perspective and what can and cannot happen mm -hmm. will change. Yeah. And then the more you train, the more you start to do things, the different uh, targets on the body that you attack will be the different reactions in the body that, that happens. Yeah. You know? That's how I do it. 
and I'm not good at it, but that's how I do it. And it keeps yeah, me okay. That's the reason people come to train with us is because they like the way you apply stuff. Don't even. Just just by figuring out, you know, what can and cannot happen. Yeah. That's, I, that's you know, it, it's interesting. That's all. I think that where I would start is, like you said, like actually, like no Lakata. Mm-hmm. I would start with very, very basic ideas first so that you'd mm-hmm. at least understand that there's, you know, a person on the other end of what you're doing and, and yeah. look at what the standard idea is for like a down block or a step and punch. Start there. And then like, I think the issue is going to come in like Jeremiah was saying, if you don't understand different types of attacks or even like a couple of attacks that are not karate attacks, that's going to be very difficult for you to understand application. You know, at least understanding what a close range altercation looks like because most altercations are not going to be at a long distance. And obviously that's not exactly what we're training for anyway. If we're going to look at application, we're, we're training for close distance. So understanding what some of those attacks look like. For me, and I and I talked about this in another podcast. I think we we did a podcast on Bunkai a while back, but mm-hmm. or application. Um, the way that it started to become easier for me is I am so like geometric in my thinking that I had to break every move into three pieces, and this kind of got gave me a starting point for application. So every move has a shape that it makes before you begin the move, and then the move has a path, and then the move has an ending point. So to me, it's like a it's like a line segment with two dots on the ends. Mm-hmm. So if you can look at the beginning position and say, okay, what are some ideas for this shape that I'm making with my body? Could I do something with this shape? That's that's some ideas there. And then the path of the movement. Is there things that I could do with the path of this move or like a slight alteration of the path of this move? So there are some ideas there. And then the ending shape of the movement. You know, what could this ending shape be doing if it was doing something slightly different than just stepping and punching or stepping and down blocking? I feel like if, if you have those, if those are the three principles of the move, like, okay, this is very, very, very elementary, but if those are the three princi- principles of the move and you just change one of those things, then there's a lots of possibilities there. So a punch becomes a push on a person or a down block becomes an attack. I'll, I just say, think, I'll say this. Um, I there. discourage people trying to do the cookie cutter or basic jka application stuff really yeah, yeah, yeah for example if you do a down block to a kick and that's where you start your thinking mm-hmm. you're already wrong yeah because let's be real mm-hmm. by simply changing the trajectory of the front kick and giving it a slight angle you'll get your foot around the arm mm-hmm. and kick them dead in the ribs yeah that's right secondly you're trying to stop a large limb mm-hmm. with a smaller limb mm-hmm. oh you could talk about dynamic mm-hmm. movement and this and that but if you're looking at application, you want to try to avoid those kind of matchups. Well, what if you did this? What if you started with like, okay, down block. And we're going to say, okay, down block's against a kick. So we do standard kick, standard down block, da-doom, we win. Then the person changes the kick, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. So we're like, okay, well, let's try a different technique. And then they do do a step and punch. And then we try it against that technique. And then they change the step and punch to something different, like a hook punch. And we're like, okay, well, that doesn't work. What if you tried different attacks as the, as the bad guy? You try different attacks. We try to make our technique work. So obviously it's reverse engineering. But what if we do that to come up with different ideas and we say, can the principle of this Re- move apply reverse, to this? Reverse engineering is, gen- is genius. It, it'll help you out all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the only thing that we can't do. But because that's that you have a foundation to understand and back off it, right? Mm-hmm. All I'm concerned with is reinforcing horrible application protocol oh yeah no, no. if you stop at down at down block to a kick then you're you completely missed the point right. and i wasn't saying that to that, even stop there yeah, i just mean no, to have somebody in front of you right that's what i was saying is like think about like realistic impact yeah you know that's the whole if point. someone's trying to kick you and mm-hmm. you try to block them with your arm yeah how many times have you seen someone dislocate their shoulder because it was a poor time to kick yeah against someone who's not trying to kick you or is just kicking at you Yep. Completely different, completely different timing, completely different trajectory. Generally, you'll get killed trying yeah. to do that. Really funny side note, because like you talked about like changing the angle of the kick and kicking to the ribs. There's this great video of Steve Ubel Sensei on um, YouTube, and he doesn't even change the trajectory of his kick. He just kicks straight in. He said, someone who's actually decent at a front kick will kick you every time, and you will not be able to get the block in. Someone who's actually good at front kicking will never, ever, ever be able to block someone with a down block. Mm-hmm. Just saying. So, you got to be practical. Go. I mean, since Ubel Sensei has always said that application is simple, it's practical. 
there's not this elaborate thing. Yeah. The elaborate, so, the elaborateness of it will cause it to fail. Yeah. He's saying he means simple as in like not a ton of steps and like to the point and effective, not right. like direct. You know, not like oh, this was easy. Ooh. No, no, direct. Yeah. Direct thought and and your intention has to be clear. Yeah. Uh, I would also encourage an application that don't think of it as a fight. Think of it as a way to get out of a fight. Yeah. So within three moves, if you ain't got someone hit hard mm -hmm. or in a compromised position, mm -hmm. you might want to reconsider that application. Yeah. I mean, within a move or two, you should be able to apply a joint lock or a knockout blow mm -hmm. and move on. That is the intention of karate. That's yeah. how you avoid the fight mm -hmm. is that you end it quickly. Yeah. In a militaristic application view obviously mm -hmm. there's other things spiritually emotionally and um, that you could avoid fights but karate in a physical form that is how they do it yeah you could you could do a rap battle instead yeah you know whatever <laughs> you, you could make my uh, your mama jokes too you know yeah and it's all good it's just in a physical form karate is maybe within two steps a good knockout a good a, you should be in an advantageous point yeah you should not be in a, a point of, of despair yeah so, what you working on? Uh, multiple things. I am still working on strength and conditioning. I'm trying to get that consistently throughout my karate turn. Mm -hmm. I incorporated the weight training again with the weighted vest, ankle weights, and wrist weights. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to get it all good. I've worked on my furodachi this past week and my side snap kick. Mm -hmm. um, my side snap kick is so hit and miss. I've kind of, I haven't kind of been able to make it consistently the same. Yeah. And that's driving me up the, the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to figure out what path I need to do and how to keep my leg in the right position. But you know, it's not habit yet. And it pisses me off because sometimes I forget what I'm working on. <laughs> uh, the furodachi seems to feel more solid. Um, and I feel I'm controlling it through the back leg better. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. The dog is over here making noises. It's not me like snorting or something. Um, well, I took a couple weeks off of switching because um, something about the way that I was going into stance was kind of tweaking my knee and I don't need that again. So I took a couple weeks off and feel a lot better. Um, I'm working on in stepping. Uh, I realize still that, so like stepping in general, step and punch, stepping in foot dodge, doesn't really matter what stance. When I'm moving forward, I am getting better about like driving off my, so the leg that's initially my back leg, I'm getting better about driving off that leg to go forward. But the problem is that I push off that leg and then my body like kind of floats in space and doesn't really move that much. And then all of a sudden I speed up and do the latter half of the movement rather than taking off like an actual sprinter I was a sprinter in high school. Like you'd think I'd be able to do this. Um, pushing off off of that back leg and as the weight transfers to the front leg, pull pushing into the next part of the movement. I'm not really using both legs. So um, I realized like how bad that had, like how that, that was that's kind of the next weak link in my step in. So that's kind of the big thing that I've been working on is pushing off that back leg, immediately pulling and then pushing off of what becomes the new back leg and and trying to stay level there. Work so on the you're end trying of to coordinate chin. walking? Yeah, basically. I'm trying to learn how to walk again. Good job. I'm learning step and punch. Wait, wait, wait. Step to, and punch. Wait, wait to progress. I've spent the past five years just learning how to step in front stands. That's what, yeah. that's, what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Hey, whatever. I think there's something mentally wrong with us. And you know what? I think our approach keeps karate interesting. You know, yeah. It's it's yeah. like it's like car guys saying you never know, want to know how much the re, the build costs you. You never want to think about the prices of the parts because if you do, you'll realize that you're just wasting your money on something. I think it's the same in karate. You don't ever want to think about the time you spent on a technique. Mm -hmm. You just want to think about the progress and, and the end result because progress, not progress. Um, because you if fancy you dwell you on the, that the, the time spent on things, you, you think you're stupid. You're absolutely mad. No, I think, I, to be honest, like, even uh, no, though I I'm joke sorry. about it. Everybody else thinks you're stupid. Sure. <clears throat> well, honestly, like, even though it has been a long time working on some of the similar ideas, to me, it's like, I don't know, it's something to look forward to. It's something to get better at. So if you don't have something to look forward to or something to work on, like, what's the point? Like, Gary Vee always talks about it's the process, not the end goal. So, like, once you get to the end goal, then what? Then you have nothing to look forward to anymore. So it's the whole idea of mastery anyway. Mm. Yeah. Boom! Mic drop. I'm not gonna drop this mic because it's expensive, but it really wasn't a mic drop, but whatever. It totally was. 
whatever. Thanks for listening. Hopefully we answered your questions. If you have more questions for our next Q&A, you're welcome to drop them in comments below if you're listening on YouTube. Or you can send us, apparently you can send us like a little a voice thing if you listen on Anchor. If you're listening on another podcasting platform, you may have to email us because I have no idea how to view any of those comments. <laughs> but anyhow, if you want us to answer some of your questions because you think that we're super geniuses, then you can message us somehow. Otherwise, we will, um, right, let me say we will that speak to you next that, time. That I'm not embarrassed. Whatever. If you want to send us some uh, some questions, we'd really appreciate it because we have, lack the imagination to keep continually have these conversations and, and keeping them interest, interesting. We not because we're geniuses. It's actually because we're not geniuses that we need your help. So, we could just sit here and talk crap about people for, you know, 45 minutes. That'd be fun. You guys would love that. Only if it was entertaining. And if you knew the people. But that's besides the point. Our yeah, circle's small, so it doesn't matter. We could do, you know how they, they actually have, like, reaction videos? Like, voice teacher reacts to this singer. And they do, like, a video where, like, you're watching the video and you react to it. We could do that to karate stuff. Like, people who oh, put up dude, coronavirus just... videos. We could sit there and, like, film ourselves reacting to people's coronavirus videos. That would be amazing. Um, we would be such yeah, ha- such that, haters. That would be... That would definitely be... That would be a career ender. Yeah? We'd burn a lot of bridges that way. We would burn a lot of bridges. <laughs> and we'd be considered really judgmental. But, we sure would. But you know what? It's fun. Well, we could, you fun. can say when there's good things. Well, oh, that was know? good. Oh, that sucked. Uh, you know, it's just good to have. It's, it's in-house entertainment. That's all it is. We'll do that for ourselves and not film it. Okay, anyway, yeah. if you have any questions, be sure to message us. We'll, we will not talk to you next time. We will talk at you while you listen and, and we don't hear anything that you say. Thanks. Next time. Okay, bye. Bye.